Welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is Wrench Every Day. And if we take a short trip back in time, you'll remember a group of four friends and myself had the terribly questionable idea of entering a cross country race in a short bus. And uh, not only did we finish, we finished quite well and had a ton of fun doing that. But Cannonball history is filled with questionable vehicle choices. I don't, it's maybe a little bit partial for me to say the school bus was number one, but a very well known questionable vehicle is the Brock Yates Hal Needham Ambulance, the Medivan. <laughs> This one isn't it. It is probably the most accurate recreation of one ever made. It belongs to a good friend, Travis Bell, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit of history why this van is so cool and what makes it special. Now, most questionable ideas tend to begin, well, around a few adult beverages, if we're honest, and Hal Needham and Brock Yates were sitting around a bar when Hal suggested the idea to enter their 1979 C2C run the last that they were officially doing in an ambulance. Who is gonna pull an ambulance over racing across the country with a patient? So they tracked down probably the most difficult, least desirable Dodge van that they could have found, a 78 B200. They ordered it, the orange and the white, Spinnaker white and Sunrise orange. You can order a van that ugly that year. They ordered it, they shipped it to Bill Mitchell's shop in Connecticut. Which was then outfitted with a 502 cubic inch Mopar Dick Landy built engine, which is uh, basically a NASCAR spec engine from the time. Lots of horsepower in a van meant to go fast. The problem is due to build schedules, there wasn't much testing done. It basically showed up to the Goodwife Shopping Center where uh, they punched in their start clock and made 50 feet, where it broke down and how went and spent a lot of money. Some guys broke into an auto parts store and they got it going and they were able to take off out of the parking lot sideways. They were gone. And that thing was on rails. And um, the original ambulance got pulled over in New Jersey by Mark Finnick and uh, they had let him go because they the story that they tell in the movie is basically the same story that was told by Lyle Royer. They said they had to get the senator's wife to UCLA because she had cysts on the walls of her lungs. And that's what happened. So they drove it all the way across the United States. All the way to the finish line. Not of the race to, to their own finish line, the uh, Wagon Wheel Cafe at the Palm Desert in Arizona. It's where those dinosaurs are kind of historically known for, you know, out, out in the desert. It's just a cool little spot. And well, they stopped there and the van proceeded to catch fire. The fire went out and it was towed to the finish line. So being a big fan of the van, the Cannonball movie, Travis went out and found himself one of these vans, something that was very easy to do. In 1978, the Dodge van had a major overhaul. They had a bigger turn signal, a recessed door handle, a larger rear taillight, and Brock Yates, Hal Needham, decided to use a 78. Not only that, it's a sliding door with barn doors on the back, and a sportsman with a sunroof, which is the hardest thing on God's green earth. I can find you as many 69 Dodge Charger Daytonas or Superbirds that you would like, but I beg of you to go find me a 78 Dodge B200, six window slider with burn doors. And fully recreated, he regularly harassed Brock Yates for all the little details to make it, again, as absolutely perfect as possible. The problem is he made it too perfect. When you follow the recipe that didn't work the first time, it's probably not gonna work the second time. So trying to write the did not finish of the first Transcon Medivac, they set out and didn't even start. The van broke down and couldn't even make it the 50 feet of the first one. So they took it back to the drawing board, fixed a few more things, modernized a couple additional components of the van, and then set out and got about halfway across the country in the third attempt where it broke down once again. And that brings us to today, when sitting around a campfire, possibly some beverages involved, a group of us talking with Travis said, we are going to help. We are gonna get this van, we are gonna modernize, even more modernize, all of the fuel injection systems that we can. We are gonna fix some of the other small problems. So hopefully, fourth time is the charm. You know, normally it's the third time. We're going for the fourth time. We are gonna go through 
and do a lot of small upgrades and cleanup work that finally, finally, this van will finally break the 50 year plus curse of never making it New York to LA. So fingers crossed, we are going to get it across the line and Ed and I will finally finish what they started in 1979. So I'm gonna pick you guys up and we're gonna take a quick walk around the van. I'm gonna show you some of the really exciting attention to detail and features that went into it. Then we're gonna start taking it apart and we'll talk about some of the parts we're gonna put into it. The biggest thing when it comes to what we are trying to do in this van is build in redundancies. So if something breaks, it's very easily switched to a backup unit, you know, insurance. And I'll tell you what, when it comes to insurance, today's sponsor, Policy Genius, has help for you. Insurance is something you have to have. And in a world where everything just keeps getting more and more expensive, it's nice to have someone on your side trying to help you save money. That's what Policy Genius does. Policy Genius does all the work for you by comparing prices from all the top insurers to ensure you get the best coverage at the right price. Since 2014, Policy Genius has helped 30 million people shop for home and auto policies and helped place over $120 billion in coverage. Just like we made something amazing in Johnny up above me by bundling Corvette suspension and an old international truck, Policy Genius can help you save a lot of money by bundling your home and auto insurance. Getting started is incredibly easy. First, head on over to policygenius.com slash wrench, where you'll then answer a couple quick questions about yourself and your property. Policy Genius will then show you price estimates for policies that best fit your needs and help you find the best option. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies. If they find a policy with a better rate than what you're paying now, they'll do all the work to switch you for free. Policy Genius has saved customers an average of $1,250 over what they were paying on home and auto insurance. That's, you know, like two tanks of diesel in the current market. So head on over to policygenius.com slash wrench and get your free home and auto insurance quotes and see just how much you can save. Okay, so we are handheld. I'd like to introduce everyone. This is David. He ran also during the 50th anniversary in what everyone dubbed the Cheat DI because it Technically dynoed over 100 horsepower. 125, but we carried 240 pounds of concrete in the back seat. To, ma to match the penalty for being overpowered. And, 10 pounds per horsepower. And they finished first, him and Bradley, overall time winners. Yep. But the real winners of the event, there is a group of people that, uh, two absolutely insane people. My, it's not, that wasn't a questionable idea. It was an insane idea that they Incredible. finished this livery the first time this livery has made it across the country in an event in a Suzuki Joy Pop. <laughs> All right, but we are not here to talk about Joy Pops or uh, our 50th anniversary run. We're here to finally help this break its 50th anniversary of failing to get across the country. One of the coolest features, we'll open up again. Travis was able to get the signatures of Brock Yates, Hal Needham, and Lady Pamela. Those, uh, again, Brock is kind of the godfather of Cannonball. Hal is the original questionable idea facilitator. I guess if anyone signed the dash and the boss, that would, Hal would be replaced with Henry and um, JP would be Lady Pamela. But, <laughs> but seeing those signatures there are absolutely phenomenal. We have a, uh, this is a little checklist of things they wanted to improve, but this thing is just insane so we've got the sunroof we've got a fancy digital rear view mirror we've got some countermeasures we've got this big old command center here with the wheel and sirens we've got gauges everywhere police scanners like just phenomenal recreation but where it gets really special let's see. it is an ambulance there is a actual gurney that uh straps down you have patient monitoring oxygen breathing the gauges there for the oxygen are volt meters for the dual battery system in the vehicle you have power port to charge your phones and accessories and i mean it looks like a proper ambulance in there like travis did a good job like recreating that right 100 percent. this is as close as you could get while being that much better it's just a really cool thing here. But again, what really makes this special is its engine, right? Oh, yeah. We keep talking about it. So how about I'll stand by the exhaust and you go start this up. So oh, that's right. 78 Dodge van. This thing is violent. 
it is just, it's silly to stand on the outside and just watch this thing rock back and forth. So ridiculous. We can go ahead and turn it off. So if you're not too familiar with vans, much like the school bus, there's a dog box or a dog house that houses the engine. All of our work is going to be in there. We're going to be putting in a new fuel injection system. We're changing the fuel pump setup drastically because the fuel pump was the failure that put this thing on the side of the road in its last attempt. So it's the bane of every cannonballer's existence, the fuel system. Yeah, heat on the fuel pump. So we're going to be changing that whole setup. But in order to do any of that, we have got to get this entire box and everything set up and moved back so we can have a little bit more room to start showing you some more of what is absolutely crazy on this and then uh, we'll start taking it apart and showing and comparing our new parts oh yeah All right, so when you look at the engine bay from the front here with the hood open, you see a real nice ram induction there. It takes a little bit of forced air, breathes it back to the air cleaner, and it looks like this is gonna be a miserable time to work. Also, that's Dodge wiring. This is the Travis wiring. This is nice and clean. That's 1978 Dodge. So, you know, wire like this, not like that. But with the dog box and that out, look at, we have got so much room for activity here, David. Oh yeah. So we can see nice and plain, this massive, massive engine. We've got the serpentine belt system. One other small repair that we're gonna have to do, it's kind of hard to see right now, but there's a thermostat housing there that is leaking that we are gonna replace. But the main thing we're doing is we're going to replace this fuel injection unit. We need better control and there's a lot of limitations in this computer system that's on it. This is good for the weekenders, but if you need to go full throttle across the country, there might be something a little bit more robust available. And we're gonna talk about that. Something else, it's kind of hard to see at this angle, but there, oh yeah, David will pick this up for us. Look at this ignition system. When we were talking about redundancy, I'm gonna take as long as I can because this is really light. This is historically accurate. Too. Yeah. <laughs> there are two basically NASCAR ignition boxes, two ignition coils. They go to this little ignition splitter, which then sends spark to that wire, which comes all the way and goes to the very front of the, it's like the longest coil wire ever. Uh huh. So the problem with a wire this long, one, you can actually run into some spark latency when it gets to your distributor. So your timing can be a little bit off. Also the spark from a spark plug wire makes a ton of electrical noise. And having it Here, right we, underneath we, with all of these. Yeah, all things. of your sensors and wires. Police it's not, scanner. yeah, it's not the best. It just is gonna make a lot, you can set that back down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's really lightweight. Yeah, I mean, it's not solid wood at all. No. So that runs all the way in the front because on a Mopar, your distributor lives in the very front. So now we can talk a little bit about what we're gonna put in. So I'm going to grab a table so we can unbox new parts. Ooh. All right, here are the primary components that we're upgrading. Now there are a lot of other small things that we got from Holly, fuel lines and fittings and just the little stuff to make all of this connect together. But this is kind of the main basis of our upgrades. First, we have the Holly Sniper. What's great about the Holly Sniper EFI system is it's just a simple carb replacement. It will drop down, you connect a couple wires and with an auto-tune feature, just about anyone can get it running on their engine. This is set up where we have slightly larger fuel injectors and it's designed to carry a lot more fuel. Well, cause that's not a stock engine. Your computers are actually built in to this unit. So other than a handheld O2 sensor and a couple small you know, coolant temperature sensors, this is it for bolting onto an engine. But that likes a really nice, good, clean timing signal. So that's entering our HyperSpark. This is a 
really nice distributor. It's Billet. It has our Hall Effect sensor that generates the position sensor of the engine, which will then send to our HyperSpark module, which then generates the RPM signal back to the sniper. So these all work together. Then we've got this nice hot coil. This is a, you know, when your coil has a heat sink, it's serious business. It, it's going to send a real nice spark. Now that fuel pump, that's a big fuel pump, right? Oh yeah. But that's not the fuel pump to feed the, the, the EFI. We're actually getting a different pump. They sent a really cool drop in system. They have all kinds of options for factory kind of hot rod classic cars, but they didn't quite have what they sent we didn't like we wanted two fuel pumps because that's what broke it the first time so. Ex exactly so by going away from it currently has an external mounted fuel pump like your uh your hot rod guys will have like a 1000s things like that uh or even Bosch 044 styles yeah. like this like behemoth uh we're going to an in tank uh, sort of a wabro style like an oe style pump so that yeah. way the failure rate on those is extremely low they're very quiet and they're extremely reliable yeah so by going to an internal pump setup, we are going to actually be able to use the fuel to cool the pumps. Exactly. So, but what this super high flow pump is for is our transfer pump. Um, this pump supports 800 to 1000 naturally aspirated horsepower. They complained about how long it took to get fuel from the auxiliary to the primary tank. So, um, no more ramrod. <laughs> It's, it's it's coming it's it's going to transfer very quickly so they'll have to uh watch the fuel gauge on the primary tank and shut that off pretty quickly otherwise uh <laughs> they might be pouring gas out down, going down the road we're going to get this stuff on start getting calibrated so back inside the car oh boy <laughs> kind of quickly huh oh yeah <laughs> so originally we were just going to change the throttle body fuel injection unit and as you can tell there's no intake manifold on it and <laughs> the reasoning for that is the might as wells but we're, actually we're trying to make it a lot better so i'll walk over there in a second and show you that why we decided to pull it but we also were noticing travis mentioned he had a slight coolant leak and got us a new thermostat housing but what we actually found were these heater core hoses. This is a three quarter hose on a five eighths barb swollen. And this one here actually has a cut in it. So we're gonna have to pick up some new heater core hoses. We're gonna replace all of those, but let me walk you to the intake manifold. Now this is what you will call a dual plane intake where essentially the air is flowing, you know, it's kind of set up to be an equal runner at two different heights. But the problem is with a throttle body fuel injection system, you need a perfect kind of balanced all of your cylinders together to generate a reference signal. With this big wall here, you're not able to get that. So some people will run and this engine had a one inch spacer, which kind of helps balance it and work fairly well. But the problem is in a very high performance application that can cause problems. So we pulled this because I'm gonna go through and actually machine this wall out. So it's almost like a single plane at top. It's gonna make the throttle body much, much happier and give us a better signal. So I'm gonna be grinding on that. David is going to work a little bit on the cooling system and pulling the rest of the old fuel injection system out and getting it ready for new wiring. We're gonna just keep plugging away, getting some things more apart, a couple more parts ordered, waiting on things to come in, but it's it's looking promising i'm feeling good about finding these small problems so we can make it perfect <laughs>
just like that, we have a single plane, sort of. Yeah. It's full so, race. Full race. We went from three quarters <laughs> straight to full race. But we've got that wall fully knocked out. So it's going to marginally affect the performance of it as a dual, dual plane, plane, but it's going to actually make our vacuum reference much and, better at yeah. idle and stuff and at low and, speed and stuff like yeah. that so when the truck's cruising around you don't end up with these weird like stumble spots and it's like oh wow yeah. there's all this vacuum all of a sudden and then yeah. there's not and, yeah. well and even still at full throttle circumstances if half of the engine is running ever so slightly different yeah it'll throw it off it has no clue because it's only reading vacuum from four cylinders so indeed this is the best way to do it we are most likely going to run that and the spacer for clearance and for the ram air but we know we have a good vacuum signal but we've kind of hit the point of the project where it's like all right we're going to get this done and we're going to get that done and then each one of those ends up needing one this or two part. more parts so we're basically at the point where we got a lot of parts, but uh, it's late and the parts store is closed and we got to go in the morning to get it. come around and actually show you what he's been working on we've got the intake manifold back on with the new gasket after porting and uh, david has gotten the sniper installed right it's ready to start right yeah mm -hmm. totally <laughs> so we've got it in we've changed a couple of the sensors over uh we discovered that the uh van was never going full throttle that was nice so you could go 70 percent, but not 100 percent. so we've made some adjustments in the throttle linkage show it now we'll uh well, you can't quite see there's not enough light but believe me it goes full throttle and we're working on the regulator setup the old one was internally regulated and it didn't work right no it was somewhere between 70 and 85 pounds whatever it felt like yeah psi of fuel pressure which generally we're going to set between 43 and 50 psi static the way the fuel pressure regulator will work is you have fuel go in and then there's a spring diaphragm that you can adjust the tension on on top and once it reaches the desired pressure it goes out so you'll sometimes set this up to where it will go in to your unit your fuel injection rail or whatever then come into this and you'd block off a port the way we're going to do it is we're going to have our fuel come into one side tee off also going to the front and dead head in and create the pressure we need to open the diaphragm and it will return out of the bottom yeah. so we're just again trying to make things as reliable as possible we're at the point where we're going to run some of the wires get some of that set up plan out uh hopefully our last summit run we've got our new fancy fuel pump showing up today yep and so that's where we're at and if you noticed in that last stretch it was almost exclusively david working and it's not because i wasn't working i was doing something else yeah so sneak peek there's a car trek car out there that needed a whole lot of love to get ready for filming so that's what i was doing while david was cleaning up the wiring because believe it or not despite it being a van there's not room for two of us in there all right so we are jumping a couple weeks ahead we had car trek david had racing and race cars to tune but we are back on the van so we're gonna get you caught up with some of the new parts that we got that we didn't have decided we want because again this thing has failed so many times we want to make it fail to fail right exactly so one thing we have sitting here is a fuel tank that is a newer tank from a standard efi that travis got us it is for a fuel injected van but we didn't like that right yeah because of the super slick setup that holly makes it's yeah. designed to retrofit into any old hot rod tank yeah so this is a twin pump design and again the engine doesn't make the horsepower to need two of those not even one of them yeah well one is more than enough for what horsepower this makes but we wanted redundancies so that what stopped the van before was a fuel pump failure 
Um, really, just going internal is good enough. Yeah, but to an OEM style, <laughs> continuous duty rated, silent, fuel cooled, not sitting on uh, directly over an exhaust. And we're deciding to retrofit it into this tank. And again, this setup is designed where if you've got a fuel tank and the ability to put a four inch hole in the top of it, you can have this pump. <laughs> exactly. So, so this is designed that it has this nice large cushion. When you start tightening, these bolts and wings will come out and actually clamp it down. And then if it's not deep enough, hey, nice cert. Go to Bunker Branding, you can get one of your own. But uh, if you need to shorten this up a little bit more, these can be cut if it's not deep enough. But it's just an awesome way to get EFI in any vehicle that they don't offer a tank. Now, honestly, Holly has a ton of tanks available. They just, they don't have one for that thing. So we're gonna make this work. So that's one thing I'm gonna do is drill that hole out and we're gonna mount it in this vent and rollover valve because we have vent provisions built into this. Uh, and then we are going to run our braided lines over the tank and then there's a little frame pass through about here. What we're doing very differently in the fuel system is something that you picked up. So on the floor, this is the old setup, rubber hose front to back. What we are doing, is uh, overkill. This is actual fuel line. So all we're going to end up having is two short whips of braided stainless steel coming from the tank and the fuel pumps to that. And then two at the front that go to the fuel pressure regulator and to the throttle body, just nice and simple. Um, mm -hmm. Less chance for leaking and failure. And again, we are trying to make the van fail to fail so um we're still finishing up a little bit of the wiring removal we are still waiting on our valve covers to get in and then we're getting a drive shaft made in the morning because again our drive shaft was too short so we've got to get the gear vendors out i've got to drill the fuel tank and still lots of wiring so we're going to set up cameras and uh yeah just get to work Let's get you caught up on some of the things that happened to this fuel tank before I get it stuck back in, because once it's in, you're not gonna see anything. We have got that Holly conversion pump mounted in. It was incredibly easy. Again, it's cut a four inch hole, measure your depth, and then you turn those four locks in. Oh, it's gonna be real windy, sorry. It's a beautiful day and we've got the door open. But uh, you turn those lock, torque it down to, they give you the range 40 to 60 inch pounds. And then I've got my lines just kind of roughly made so that way we can feed them through. And then I'm going to run our power. I went kind of overkill, use some of the Holly abrasion and fire shield, uh, put a connector on it that, you know, it's overkill. Overkill is better than not enough. So we'll get that run. So this tank is ready to go back in. We also had new transmission cooler lines made. This is a 2,250 PSI working range. They burst at about 10,000 PSI, going to a thermostat to that transmission cooler underneath 
Again, it's just the principle of no more failures. We currently have that new drive shaft being made, which, uh, guess what? It's kind of overkill. We've working on the plumbing a little bit. You can kind of see the hard lines just loosely stuck in place. We still need to kind of pull and blow those out and get fittings on them, but it's just a bunch of little things. So we're gonna just keep on little thinning our way through it and uh, running around to try to get this uh, ridiculous van back to ambulancing. Underneath, we are, oh, it's set to David height. This is just kind of loose run. We're going to still uh, Adele clamp, right? Adele, yes. We're gonna roll them right in the deep. We're gonna Adele clamp it up so it sits nice like it's supposed to, and uh, instead of just rubber, uh, that's kind of how you should really do it. We've got the tank in, and this is just rough in. They're not tight just yet, which we will forget about, and then turn the key on and spray fuel all over everything all right because that's what you do predictably every time we come out from the pump we've got our nice holly filter mounted with you know my real pretty arrows to confirm the arrow we're covering this will loop and get secured up and then it meets our hard line and then that hard line back this still needs its bracket made but again we went past 11 all the way to 12 or 13 on those trans cooler lines huh yeah <laughs> Better heat and abrasion resistance than like the usual parts store trans line, trans cooler lines. Yeah. I mean, these could take a rock, an angle grinder. This is basically built to be on a form implement and just abused. So they're 2,250 PSI of working pressure, which means almost, if not a little bit more than 10,000 PSI burst pressure. And have you ever seen a Dodge 727 torque flight make 400 psi <laughs> so, yeah so it's we're gonna... easily easily 10 times the the yeah. amount of working <laughs> pressure that it'll see all right so it's uh the next day more parts have been gotten and one of the big things is uh that big beautiful drive shaft four inch aluminum upgraded u-joints front and rear we've got 1350s in the front 1332 big dodge in the rear so this is little dodge that is big dodge lighting is just being a mess but let's see if we can try to there you go so you can see how much smaller the old u-joint was in comparison to what we've got going on now of course this is still a dodge eight and a quarter so it can explode at any given moment but we are no longer running the baby joint the other big reason we wanted to do this is there wasn't a way to go to a Dodge joint to an American, like a Spicer 1310, 1330 without having a greasable joint. Now I know what you're gonna say, greasable joints, it sounds like a good thing. It's something you can service, you can uh, lubricate your U-joints. But when you start making a lot of power, having the hollow sections of that U-joint to allow grease to travel through, actually weaken the joints substantially. So you want solid joints and it's just something where you have the expectation of replacing more than greasing and lubing. And it's just, again, a matter of strength. 
it doesn't seem like much when you have a, a joint that's gun drilled, but all of those little little bits of metal uh, can equate to uh, a broken and catapulting drive shaft. Something else we've got done is our gear vendors is back in there. We went through the process of having to make a gasket because unfortunately when the separated it tore, but we were able to go through with the small hammer, transfer paper, cut, draw, and we've got that there. We have a new seal and a new bushing and it's ready to receive, receive that shaft. So aluminum is great. This, even though it's bigger and technically longer than the old one, it weighs less than that steel shaft. We're going to get proper engagement on the yoke and hopefully no more vibrations while this thing's running at speed. Uh, also last night we got power run to the pumps. We've got a lot of wiring, those valve covers going in there. There's just a tremendous amount of work to do. So we're gonna get back to doing it. Turns out that uh, something I was a little bit worried about ended up being something we really should be worried about and has stopped the medevac in its tracks. The van that never fails to fail is failing, but we're going to fix it. It just unfortunately means we're not ending the episode with big burnouts. That's what David really wanted to do. He, he likes uh, getting me in trouble with the landlord. So... Um, the smart among you, or and I won't say smart, the educated in gear vendors among you would have noticed a small problem. That gasket we made, and I was thinking it could be a problem. When I took it apart, I saw very exacting shims. And uh, what did you find out when uh, Rick from Gear Vendors called you back? So the material that the gaskets are made of that for the gear vendors, they're a non-compressible style gasket. And are effectively part of the shim. They're extremely important, yeah. <laughs> they have a very exacting tolerance. You can't just go to the parts store and slap some old gasket maker in there. It just doesn't work that way. So this gets to come back out and apart. And uh, turns out we can get this part. It's a semi-universal part. Those... Those two gaskets, not so much. So they're coming, but we can't get them in time. But man, look at that shaft. Look at this hotness. I mean, I, I, so I covered that while you were running for parts, but <laughs> <laughs> um, what that means is today was our deadline to try to wrap it up because 
you have an important date. You're going to go see Garth Brooks. Yeah. Girlfriend got me tickets to it. It's uh, it's going to be uh, just uh, it's going to be a time. It'll be a good time. She, I was going to say she's going to probably watch this. You want to be more excited. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so to make sure David doesn't end up single, I don't want to be okay. the cause cause of that again. <laughs> We're going to have to end with the stupid thing having to come back apart. We've got like four wires left to hook up and fluids to put in this thing, and then we're going to be driving it. So, not not today, because that's, that's just how the van life is going to be. So our next time when we can get David up here in a couple days and we can get parts in from Rick at Gear Vendor. So thank you, Rick, for helping us out. We just... Time, time frames kind of ruined us. Uh, we're going to get this thing running and we're actually going to take you a little bit more into the tuning process and we're actually going to get a lot of seat time in this thing rather than just a quick burnout. So it's more fun for all of us and I hate ending episodes on disappointment, but hey, uh, it's not disappointing. We learned. We learned, David. We learned. We learned that uh yeah, I, I, <laughs> half the battle. yeah knowing oh well we're gonna get back to this van you guys are gonna have a lot of wrenching that you've already watched and more to watch coming up on the next medevac episode you know it's that's how it goes so yeah i'm jared reminding you to always make questionable choices and if your friend has a van that needs some help just buy everything don't don't assume anything's gonna be good it needs it all we'll see you